Hold on, back again. I've got some more questions. Now we're moving into questions concerning Muhammad, the character Muhammad, the, the standard Islamic narrative character Muhammad. This is the guy that um, that we're all following today. How did he get created? How and why did he get created? Is the questions are, and I'm gonna um, uh, the, probably the best way is to. There's so many people that have asked this, but you have chosen really two that you like to answer. One by Pence, one, and the other by Nunu. So let's, let's start with Pence, one, and his question is, Fander, it's obvious now that Muhammad was just a later creation, but why do you think that he in particular was chosen to be the prophet of this new religion? Why not just choose someone who is not a warlord? And then we have Nunu, who continues that idea, if someone accepts your chronic Nazarene hypothesis, Odun, how can he make sense of the massive amount of literature about Muhammad in the Siddha, that's the biography, in the Hadith, that's the sayings, and how did Muslims suddenly come to strongly believe in such a person if he never really existed as per the Islamic standard narrative, the IS, that's S-I-N. Mm -hmm. Over to you. Okay. Um, I think in, in order to understand this, one has to understand the big picture of the creation of Islam, the process uh, which made Islam. We said it in, in previous uh, videos, Islam did not come first. At first, there, were, there was something else, which was not Islam, which was pre-Islamic. There, there were... Uh, actual real historical events, for example, the Nazarene teaching, the Nazarene Arab alliance, the conquest of Jerusalem, the rebuilding of Jerusalem temple, the warring among the Arab leaders, and um, a caliph emerged from this process, Abdul Malik. He claimed to be the, the ruler of God's kingdom on earth, and thereafter came the Abbasids, and the Abbasids wanted also to be the rulers of God's kingdom on earth, but they had to invent something more to justify their power, and so they invented a divine revelation. And so they needed a prophet to... Um, to, to Hang it on. You have to have a prophet. To... Prophets give us revelation. You have to create a prophet. Exactly. If you have a revelation, you have to have a prophet, you have to have a book. And then you have to have a place of origin and so on. But you see, the thing is that the Abbasid could not invent their religion from scratch because events occurred. There was already a past and they had to make their religion with what they had. They had texts from which they made the Quran. They had buildings, for example, like the Dome of the Rock, and they, they could not um, destroy this building because it did not fit the narrative. They had to invent a narrative that would fit both their own purposes and also what really existed. You see, when you invent a religion from scratch, look at, for example, at the Mormons. <laughs> the Mormons invented the holy book from scratch and it fitted the narrative. Even though there are many flaws in this book, this is not the issue here, the book was made in order to justify Mormonism, Mormonism. But the Quran comes from pre-Islamic texts. And it is not per se an Islamic text. It has to be forced into an Islamic text. And this was made by creating the standard Islamic narrative, which gives an Islamic meaning to every verse. And this is why the story of Muhammad is so luxuriant, is so full of, of uh, anecdotes about what he did uh, on this day and so on, in order to give, to give uh, an Islamic um, uh, reading of every verse. This is what... Um, uh, French scholar Henri Lamins, at the beginning of the 20th century, already established. He established that the standard Islamic narrative, the Sirah, the Hadith, the Islamic tradition, 
was not made, was not written to give an historical account of what happened, but to give a sort of Islamic exegesis of what the Habasid had in the hands. This is why it is so big, because you have to invent something enormous to, to make something that is not Islamic into something Islamic. So then why the Muhammad character in particular? This has all to do with, um, with uh, adapting uh, an actual historical reality into an Islamic um, so-called reality. There was or there were people in the seventh century nicknamed Muhammad or who bore the title, the Muhammad title. And um, Muhammad, the Muhammad title passed uh, on the caliph, passed upon the caliph. It was a, a very complex process. We did uh, many videos with Jay's about coins and epigraphy, um, explaining how the, um, the, the caliph chose the first caliph, Abdul Malik, and, and his successor, and even after the Umayyad, how they... Um, how they, um, they choose the Muhammad titles for themselves and how they use the Muhammad uh, word to justify the, their powers. So during the Abbasid times, the um, scribes and uh, their masters, uh, the, the caliph masters, had to, had to use, they were kind of forced into using the Muhammad reference. And this is why they were compelled to do with the Muhammad from the seventh century. And this is why we have in the Islamic narrative some tradition that are actually historical, that uh, still convey an historical truth about the historical Muhammad. For example, her hadith tells us about that Muhammad um, was announcing the imminent coming of the Messiah, which contradicts the Islamic narrative. But they had to do with it. And so they, they made the um, prophet out of a bit of historical memories, some parts of historical memories, some collective memories that could not be erased. And they made him with um, the invention of the Islamic narrative in order to give an Islamic meaning to the, um, the Quran and to the, um, the remains of the seventh century, such as, for example, the Dome of the Rock. This is why they invented the, the night journey. The night journey is a justification of the Dome of the Rock. Night journey um, is the holiness. Mirage. Just so people know what you're saying. The it's night mirage. journey. The this is the name in English, the night journey. Isn't it, Jay? Yeah, I'm just making sure because most people, with their accent there was a little bit strong. People would not know mm -hmm. what you're saying. The, the journey by night. The journey by night, exactly. The journey by night, the Isra and Mirage from Mecca to Jerusalem up into the, the heavens. Uh, and this gave, this gives um, his, its holiness to its Islamic holiness to the city of Jerusalem. Otherwise, in the standard Islamic narrative, there would be no reason for Jerusalem to be a holy place because it is not supposed to be the place of Abraham. It's supposed to be Mecca and so on. So you see how the Muhammad character was invented from parts of actual history, from um, the need uh, for the Islamic narrative to, to, to give an Islamic meaning to what really existed, and also from something else, which is the, um, the need for... Um, the need to, to justify the, the caliph's uh, conduct, the caliph's, um, <clears throat> the, the caliph, uh, what the caliph did. For example, um, the caliph had opponents, they had uh, cartoonists, for example, or singers or poets who criticized them. And by inventing stories about Muhammad uh, having his opponents, uh, his, his caricaturists, uh, killed, um, they could justify killing their actual opponents, their actual opponents from the 8th or 9th century. 
And we have um, stories in the Islamic tradition about caliphs um, having their scribes um, uh, write stories about Muhammad in order to justify their own conduct. So you see the Muhammad uh, prophet character in, in Islam, in the Islamic tradition, is a, a very, very odd character because it is part, a bit, a tiny bit part uh, historical, a tiny, uh, a, bi a big part uh, Islamic. And also it um, reflects what the caliphs were. Well, so please. this is, uh, yes, Jay, excuse me. No, no, go ahead, conclude. So, but this is this is um, this is uh, almost a pure um, a pure creation because the historical part in in Muhammad's um, Islamic character it, it's like in a legend you have um, some um, very very um, you have an historical uh, background but it is very very remote. And you have um, a construction, um, something artificial. In, in a sense, um, Muhammad, the, the Islamic Muhammad, the Islamic Muhammad is like um, Robin Hood or Santa Claus. Or you see, it, it relies on something um, historical. Santa Claus is supposed to be Saint Nicholas. But the Santa Claus from Coca-Cola is very, very different from uh, Saint Ni the Saint Nicholas of Christian traditions. It's the same for Robin Hood or King Arthur. Um, this is how um, legendary figures are made. And Islam, in Islam, there is the, those, two, those two main reasons for the creation of uh, Muhammad. He had to exist in order to justify himself, Islam. And so many stories were invented um, in order to do so, and he, he also was a justification for the for the behavior of the of the caliphs, uh, and so many stories were invented like this also. Brilliant stuff! Thank you so much. This helps. So the the need for Muhammad, if I can encapsulate it into five areas that I hear you bring up, uh, the first one was. You need to have a prophet because this, the Jews and the Christians have a prophetic line. You're the Arabs. You don't have that prophetic line. You're the Ishmaelites. You come from another line. Therefore, you've got to create a prophet in that line. And therefore, to get theological, religious legitimacy, which you don't have yet, you need to create that prophet. Now, of course, once you have the prophet, then, uh, what comes with that, then comes the Quran. You need to have a, a revelation to him. But mm -hmm. what was fascinating is the second area that you go on, much of the Quran was now in place, and yet most of it did not really reflect who your prophet is. So you've got to impose the you've got to impose your prophet onto all those places, and that's why the the standard Islamic narrative took so long to write. You notice it only gets it only appears in the ninth century. Why was this not in the seventh century? If the Quran was there, why is it all the rest? And we've asked this question for, well, I've asked this question for 26 years. Why did it take 200 years and 300 years to get this written down? We can now see. It took that long to, it's, to impose. And you mentioned that, number three, that there was a lot of historical baggage already there. You gave the example of the Dome of the Rock. The historical back that you can't destroy the, the Dome of the Rock, so you impose a narrative onto the Dome of the Rock. And the narrative is this is where Muhammad went to the seven heavens. We look at the Dome of the Rock today and you say, this has nothing to do with the Miraj. None of the inscriptions talk about the Miraj. It had nothing to do with a man named Muhammad going up to the seven heavens. It had everything to confronting the monophysite Byzantine Christianity of the day. It was a theological reason and a political reason that they built that dome there because it's right smack dab in the middle of Jerusalem, which is the holy of holies for the Jews and looking down <coughs> upon the Church of the Sepulcher for the Christians. So it had a mm -hmm. political statement. It was a religious statement. So the narrative then had to be created to make sense of that building because you couldn't get rid of the building. So what do you do? You create the Mirai. Brilliant example. Thanks for that. But then you go on and you say that they needed the caliphs who now were had their own legitimacy. They needed, they needed, and many of them who were there in the seventh century actually took that title for themselves. The praised one, 
Abdul Malik possibly doing. We even think that sometimes mm-hmm. even Mu'awiyah may have used that title. Coveted one. Mm-hmm. They, they say one, the one. Coveted one. The one who is to be loved, adored. All of uh, these. This is the, mm-hmm. the, the one who was elevated above all others. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it already was there. It was well known. It's part of the narrative. It's part of the historical baggage that came from the Umayyad period. The Abbasids then grabbed that name and they made it into a man himself. But once you make it into a man, you've got to give him some backstory. You've got to give him some history. You've got to put meat onto him. And what do you do? You create all these sayings, you create all these the references, and you place them in a place called Mecca in this place. That's going to be a question that's coming up yet. And then what you then do, uh, then you then start putting all these stories to help you understand what the Quran is saying. And you gave mm-hmm. the example, and I thought that was interesting, not only of the Miraj, which it can only be found possibly in chapter 17, verse 1, which still doesn't make sense historically. But then you gave the example of, of the, and this is the last thing you brought into it, is for the caliphs themselves, they needed to have, they needed to have legitimacy. And so what better way to give themselves legitimacy than tagging or hanging onto Muhammad areas that they had problems with, like criticism, something as simple as criticism. People were mm-hmm. criticizing them. Well, what do you do? Well, put, let Muhammad be criticized and see what Muhammad did to criticism. He killed those who criticized him, like Asma bin Marwan, which is in the Sirah, which is in Ibn Hisham Sirah. He has her killed by Umer, who stabs her through the heart and says, blessed be her, uh, be him for having killed this woman. So that gives you legitimacy to then shut down your critics, because Muhammad is that model. Muhammad is that paradigm that you can follow. So it gives you legitimacy, both politically, and gives you legitimacy also theologically, and gives Islam legitimacy. Mm-hmm. Matt, um, I mean, to me, that would make sense. And so you can see then why now all of this took two to three hundred years to finally put together. Mm-hmm. Possibly exactly. begun by Ibn Ishaq in 765. Seventy years later, there is an awful lot more that they had learned and realized they needed. So they did away with Ibn Ishaq and let Ibn Hisham write the, mm-hmm. the standard Islamic narrative on his life. And Ibn Hisham says, "Listen, I just took even, the, even not- Ibn Hisham's Sirah, even Ibn Hisham's story about Muhammad is criticized as being not that honest. Is not a in, in, in the Islamic tradition, he is very criticized. You see, no he, even, even in the ninth century, even with Ibn Sham, the story was not um, complete yet. Yeah, but rather, than, and that's that's infighting within as to who, where, the, what the final narrative is going to be. Nonetheless, mm-hmm. today, everybody does go back to Ibn Sham as the text that you go to to find out who this prophet, what he did. And, mm-hmm. and listen, I mean, uh, you, you can look at Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, even down all the different others who then put together the Hadith. Look at the criticism they got. And then, of course, you come with Al-Tabari in the 10th century, who just puts it all out there and says, you choose which one you want. Contradiction mm-hmm. after contradiction. But this is exactly how a religion written by or created by men, how it evolves, how it works. Exactly. Well, what is really fascinating is that this discovery has been made more than a century ago, by Henri Lamance in particular, but also by others. And, and that, you see, it's been more than 100 years that we know this. And, and still, we don't, we don't understand. Um, even though it is very, very clear in Henri Lamance's writings, I, I don't know whether it, it has been translated. In, it has been translated into Henri, English. Fact, I've, got, I've got his book right I, here. I have to pull it out. Give me the date for Henri Lambert so I have it real quickly. Henri Lamas, I think he died in the 40s. But uh, I, I'd like here, just like um, here, to read the, the beginning of one of his books, which is called Fatima and the Daughters of Muhammad. And he says everything in. in in two or three sentences, he wrote. So this is the Google Translate uh, translation from uh, from from this uh, introduction. He wrote, just like the corpus of the Muslim tradition, the inspiration of the Sirah is first and foremost exegetical, derived in righteousness from the text of the Quran. The Sirah is intended to serve as a commentary in action. It must translate into precise anecdotes and picturesque anecdotes, the most obscure allusions, the least intelligible innuendo of the verses, hunting down the anonymous, the impersonal, so disconcerting in the reading of the surahs everywhere, so to speak, 
a fixed commemorative plaques, multiply the mention of proper names, dates, so carefully avoided by Muhammad, Abul Qasim, because at the time, Lamans supposed that Muhammad was the author of the Quran. So exe exegetical in the first instance, the Sirah is then doctrinal, but with more abandonment, with a less ostensible affectation than in the tradition. Yeah, and that says it. And I think this is something. You wrapped it up. Yeah. You wrapped yeah. it up. So Muhammad really, they had to have a Muhammad. They had to hang their authority, both political and theological, on a person. And once mm -hmm. you have taken that person, which was borrowed from the name that was quite popular already in the 7th century and 8th century, once you take that name, you make it into a person. Once you have it into a person, you've got to put them in a place. And once mm -hmm. you have the place, you've got to give them a revelation. It all fits to a piece. Listen, this is good. Thanks so much, Odon. Thank you. Uh, we're going to continue on and a answer more of the questions. If you have any doubts, uh, for those who have written up the questions and who are asking these brilliant questions like Pencil Pence One and Nunu, I hope you've had, I hope Odin's answered your question. And if you haven't answered, write at the bottom here on the comments, and we'll try to get back to them in the future. All right, this is Odin and Jay, three thousand miles apart, over and out. Thank you.